Hello, everyone. Welcome to Best Practices for AR Foundation. My name is John V. Hi, I'm Kateki. And a little background on us. Uh, we're from the company Crikey. We're an augmented reality mobile gaming app where create meets play. Our mission is to entertain the world through augmented reality. We launched last fall on iOS and Android, and our first big partnership was with Sony Pictures for the film Goosebumps. And we built them a series of three AR games featuring characters from the film. This year, we had the opportunity to work with the Ellen DeGeneres Wildlife Foundation and built them an AR Gorilla Trek gaming experience, which we'll be speaking more about uh, in this presentation. Just this month, we launched our very first location-based AR game based off the best-selling board game Wingspan. And we'll also speak to that game in this presentation. A little background on myself. Uh, so I'm John V, the CEO of the company. I got my BA and MBA at Stanford, an MFA at the USC film program, and previously worked at YouTube. Hey, I'm Kateki. I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at Crikey. I received my BA, MA, and PhD at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab, where my research is more on the technical side of virtual and augmented reality, so manipulating degrees of freedom and image persistence to understand their impact on user presence and immersion. While I was there, I worked at Oculus and Google X on the Glass team, and here at Crikey, I manage all things engineering, product, and design. And we're not twins, we are sisters. <laughs> Uh, and a little roadmap for today's talk. So today's talk is focused on the features, theory, and application for AR Foundation. Uh, so we'll first talk about AR Foundation's key features and advantages to using it as a developer. Next, we'll talk about theories of immersion and presence and how to utilize these in applications for mobile AR gaming. So first up, why mobile AR and why now? Uh, here at Crikey, we're very excited about AR Foundation because we believe it democratizes access to premium computer vision cross-platform. Uh, so first of all, AR Foundation is very accessible, so it does work immediately on iOS and Android, which means we can access more users right away. Secondly, all of the computer vision features inside of AR Foundation are optimized across many different types of mobile devices, which makes it easy for our users to have great AR experiences. And finally, with these two components, we can actually bridge physical and digital so that users' physical world uh, elements are blended with augmented reality experiences. And then a little bit about how Unity functions in the context of the Crikey application. So today, Unity actually controls Crikey's entire graphics pipeline. And I'll go through the three items on the left and explain how. Um, so first up, the camera. So we do use AR Foundation for all of our live computer vision inside of the Crikey camera. Second, the game. So obviously, we use the Unity game engine to build all of the game mechanics inside of Crikey. For example, touch inputs on the mobile device to interact directly with AR objects. And then finally, videos. There is a social media component to the Crikey application. We're using users receive uh, gameplay highlight reels that they can share to Crikey or other social platforms as well. And Unity uh, records the videos and edits them in real time cross-platform. I'll now talk a little bit about AR Foundation's features and some of the theoretical applications of these. So first up, just a quick overview of AR Foundation. Uh, this toolkit brings together the best of AR Kit and AR Core. Um, in this talk, we'll be focused on plane detection, camera translation, and then customizing AR Foundation by accessing raw point cloud data in real time. And now a little bit about some of the theories behind AR Foundation. Um, so first up, immersion. Immersion is about technological affordances of virtual and augmented reality and how these can be used to make users feel like their uh, virtual experiences are actually real. And there's three affordances in particular that we're focused on at Crikey. The first is degrees of freedom, or the amount to which a user can walk around inside of a virtual experience. Uh, there's degrees of freedom three, which is rotation only, and then degrees of freedom six, which is rotation and translation. Uh, we believe that degrees of freedom six is the ideal amount of movement inside of a virtual experience so that users can actually walk close to augmented reality objects. The second affordance latency is about the amount of lag in a rendered environment. Using AR Foundation, we actually see very low latency across a high number of mobile devices, which is critical for a great user experience. And then finally, stereoscopic vision. AR Foundation allows us to render 3D objects at depth in real time inside of the user's phone camera. And then a little bit about presence. While immersion is more about the technical aspects of augmented reality, presence is more about the human response to these technical features and is known as the sense of being there inside an immersive environment. We tend to quantify presence as absence. So rather, not just how much somebody feels like they're inside an augmented reality game or experience, but how absent they feel from their own physical body and surroundings during this time. On the quantitative side, we use motion and biometric data like skin conductance and heart rate to understand how people are unobtrusively responding to these experiences at Crikey. 
And how do we put this into practice? So earlier this year, we were fortunate to work with the Ellen DeGeneres Wildlife Fund to build Gorillas, which is an AR gorilla trekking gaming experience, which is available right now on our iOS and Android app. Uh, and in the experience, you play an explorer that is seeking to discover beautiful baby gorillas in different ecosystems. Our goal with this game was to encourage empathy between the player and the gorilla and to try to inspire real-world conservation behavior change. In the next few slides, we'll share a little sneak peek of a trailer of what the game looks like and also how we built it using AR Foundation and computer vision tools. So we'll now talk a little bit about some of the ways that Crikey has customized AR Foundation for our own purposes. So first up, the dynamic ground plane. So with AR Foundation, we can actually detect multiple horizontal and vertical planes in the camera in real time. AR Foundation then knows the lowest of these planes horizontally and determines that to be the ground. Uh, and we can grow assets from this. Um, and so what you're seeing in the video at left is in the Ellen DeGeneres Wildlife Fund Gorilla Track game, uh, as the user moves their phone and AR Foundation finds new points on the lowest plane, we can actually grow uh, new Rwandan forest assets, uh, thereby increasing the play area for the user and generating a dynamic dynamic feel to the experience. The second trick that we've employed at Crikey is something that we call the default ground plane. While AR Foundation works great as a toolkit, because we are a consumer-facing app, we can't control when or how a user chooses to open their phone camera. Therefore, there are some instances where a user is in a low-light setting or they're pointing at a surface that doesn't have a very textured surface. In these cases, what we do when, when the CV detection fails, uh, we pick a default ground plane position that's 1.5 meters away from the starting position of the user and also below. Uh, this generates the feel of a ground plane um, and allows us to retain camera translation such that users can still walk close to objects as though they're rooted in the physical world. And then finally, camera translation. Uh, what you can see in the video at right is a user walking closer uh, to an eastern screech owl in the game of wingspan, um, and the object does get larger and closer as the user approaches it. This illustrates the responsiveness of camera translation, which suggests to users that virtual objects are actually rooted in their physical world context. It also tells users that they have 360 degrees of visibility inside the AR experience, meaning that they can approach and view objects from any angle as though they're actually there. And then finally, in practice in our games, we do encourage users to try to step closer to objects, especially on the z-axis, so they can truly get the full augmented reality effect. Three billion birds have disappeared in the last 50 years in North America alone. Our new location-based augmented reality game is based off the best-selling board game Wingspan. In this game, you play an ornithologist or bird enthusiast who is protecting and collecting birds in different ecosystems on your local map. Our goal with this game was to use the mobile phone as a window back into our natural world. We hope that by building empathy between players and birds, again, we can encourage conservation behavior in the real world. Location-based gaming and AR Foundation is truly the most powerful tool today to inspire behavioral change. We'll share a short trailer of Wingspan and encourage you to download and play it. It is available on our iOS and Android app today. So we'll now talk a little bit about looking forward and how to apply some of AR Foundation's key learning to mobile AR experiences. So first up, just generally, what are some of the, the key applications of AR Foundation based on what we've talked about so far? So in this section of the talk, we'll discuss social presence, eye tracking, and generating physical awareness for users during these experiences. 
So first up, what is social presence and how does this differ from the definition of presence that we talked about earlier? Social presence means that when there's multiple users or just a single user but multiple virtual entities in a given experience, we can actually generate a sense of belonging and social connection between them based on how they interact. In practice, when applying this, some of the, me some of the methods we'll talk about today are all about nonverbal cues. Um, this is because research suggests that when we're having conversations in the physical world, oftentimes uh, nonverbal mimicry and eye contact are some of the things that can generate feelings of connection between two people. We'll start with eye contact. When AR Foundation is turned on in the camera, we know the real-time position and orientation of the user's phone. This means that as the user moves, we can actually have virtual objects track them in real time. You can see in the video at right that Slappy the ventriloquist dummy, one of the iconic villains from the Goosebumps uh, franchise, is following the user's phone camera as they walk around the room. Uh, in this case, the emotion that might be driven would be something closer to fear. However, you can imagine that if this was a baby gorilla looking at the user and moving closer to them, they might feel some empathy instead. Physical awareness is also another key metric that we like to look at at Crikey. This is essentially the idea that users should not be passive observers in augmented reality experiences. They should feel like they're active participants. The best way to generate this feeling is to have virtual characters respond to the position of the user in real time, essentially acknowledging their presence in the virtual world. Again, because we do know the live position orientation of the user's device when AR Foundation is on in the camera, we can have virtual characters approach them or move away from them based on their personality. And then finally, a review of AR Foundation thus far and some next steps for developers to consider. So first, a little bit about tracking for experience optimizations. So far, we've discussed a lot about how to build engaging experiences, but how do you know if this is actually working? At Crikey, we think the best way to learn more about this is to actually track what users are doing during the experience. For example, are users moving along the z-axis to get closer to objects? When do they choose to move in this direction, and how long do they stay close to those objects? Secondly, eye tracking. What objects are users, users actually looking at through the phone camera? And again, how long did they stay trained on those objects versus others? And finally, overall, what are the general movement patterns across large numbers of users? And how do they choose to actually interact with these AR experiences? And then a little word about point cloud data. So, so far, we've talked about features that are available with AR Foundation straight out of the box. However, AR Foundation does also allow access to low-level point cloud data per camera frame. These points can be manipulated to generate a myriad of different results. For example, you can cluster these points and generate real-time meshes for occlusion. Um, you can cluster these points and calculate max motion per pixel or per frame. Um, and with this, many different types of plugins can be built, um, which we'll talk about on the next slide. For example, occlusion. Occlusion is a key computer vision theory for augmented reality. It bridges the gap between what is virtual and what is real by mimicking physical world behavior almost exactly. There are two key types of occlusion. People occlusion, so hiding virtual objects behind human silhouettes, and object occlusion, hiding virtual objects behind general everyday objects like a table or a chair. Augmented reality experiences ideally should mimic physical world cues as closely as possible to generate high presence for users and high perceived realism. In practice, the way we can do this today with AR Foundation is to track points per camera feature, making sure that these points all have a 3D depth estimate. After this, we can cluster the points in every single camera frame and then generate 3D meshes on top of physical world camera features inside of Unity. These meshes can be used to occlude virtual characters behind physical world objects in real time during the gaming experience. And then finally, features in review. Today, we've talked about how powerful AR Foundation is in generating realistic social interactions and compelling game experiences. This is for a few reasons. First, AR Foundation makes mobile AR very accessible cross-platform for both iOS and Android users, and it's highly optimized. Second, it contains key technological affordances like dynamic plane detection and camera translation. Finally, these features of AR Foundation enable us to generate uh, key social presence metrics like eye contact and physical awareness to make users feel like these augmented reality experiences have truly come to life on their mobile phone. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out today. And most importantly, thank you to the Crikey team. We could not be here without you. And we do have a live demo, which we'll set up as we move into this next phase. So we're going to unplug and plug in a phone. And as we're doing that, I have gifts for everyone. So we have some stickers of our new game, which I'll pass out while we're setting up the demo. And if everyone can just grab one and pass them on to your neighbor, that would be wonderful. Thank you. There you go. 
Thank you. Yeah, so I think I'm just going to connect it directly, and then um, once we trust the computer, it should show up, and then we can do the demo. Um, just try. I'll hand out a few more. Ones. So, and I guess um, perhaps while I'm setting this up, um, if anyone has questions that they'd like to ask, we can also move to the Q&A portion of the talk and happy to answer questions while we get the live demo going. Oh, sure, yeah. Yes, go for it. Um, so, uh, while developing this, uh, what have your thoughts sort of been on uh, wearable AR technology, like glasses and things of, the, of that sort? Has that gone into any of your considerations while making this? Or? Absolutely. And it was something that we looked at early on when we were starting the company, was whether we should build for headsets or focus on building for the phone. And one of our goals early on was to make sure we could scale and to not let... Uh, economics be a barrier to any player coming to our games. And we also saw a lot of growth in India and Brazil and know that access to headsets and other additional hardware is hard to come by in those markets. And we don't want to prevent people from accessing the games we're building just due to cost. So we chose to just focus on the mobile phone for now. Can I do a follow-up to that one? Sure, absolutely. Yes. OK, so um, I. Uh, Re recently, I finished my, my uh, master's in, in games uh, with AR as the focus. Cool. And one of the things that did come up was this sort of uh, uh, phenomenon where people don't want to have their phone up for too long at a time mm -hmm. because it's, it's, like, it's awkward to hold it. And some people become extremely self-aware when they use their phone in some silly way in public. What are your like, experiences with that particular sort of phenomenon with, with this game? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, when you look at sort of the spectrum of, uh, I guess, entry points available to consumers for, uh, I guess, XR experiences at large, I think that the mobile phone is the least obtrusive and also the lowest barrier to entry. Um, I think typically people tend to be on their devices anyway. So, um, you know, using your phone to detect a ground plane, as we'll show in a second here, um, it just takes really just like one brief you know, movement with your wrist and then you're sort of into the game experience. And so I think um, compared to a headset experience, um, the mobile phone is probably much easier, even for non-early tech adopter consumers to sort of understand the value of mobile AR and feel comfortable, more importantly, using it in a public setting. And definitely where people are playing is also a consideration. And so if people are playing in their homes, they might be more likely to try different types of hardware. Um, now that we've moved into location-based gaming, people are, we're starting to see people playing out in the streets. And I think over time, that's something we'll definitely want to keep an eye on and track and see how we can impact that behavior positively or negatively through the game mechanics. I don't know if anyone else has lined up for to ask questions, but please feel free to come down and ask questions, and we'll yeah, go ahead with we'll, the with we'll the demo. Go forward with the demo, yeah. Um, so this is the game of, of Wingspan, yeah. And I'll okay. let I'll let you hold Jeez. the hold the device. So, um, so it happened it happened so quickly, but uh, Air Hurt Foundation uh, detected the plane, um, and we loaded the assets on the ground. So um, what you can see is the scissor tail flycatcher. Uh, it's it's, it is walking on the ground, and it also has its habitat. Um, the assets were dynamically spawned just at the beginning of the experience. Um, and you can see that the bird uses pathfinding to find its way around the floor and around the virtual assets that have been spawned as well. Um, and we can actually get closer to it. So as you move closer, the object will get larger. And then as you move further away, the object gets smaller um, with the camera translation feature that comes with AR Foundation. Um, and we have a, a series of different birds uh, that we can show here. 
So this is the hummingbird, same idea. So we're able to grow the assets just off of the same ground plane that was detected the very first time that we opened the camera. Um, we don't save uh, ground plane coordinates here at Crikey. Um, the reason being that, again, this is a consumer-facing product. So users tend to very rarely open the camera in the same location twice. Um, so we don't save ground plane coordinates. We always detect it fresh every single time. Do we have anyone else lined up for questions? We have all the birds here, so we've got our cheat sheet of birds. Usually, yeah, usually you have to walk, you walk on the around map to, to collect them. them. Um, but here, here in the special version of the app, they're all available via a simple menu. Yes, oh, absolutely. Course, course, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's a great, great question. So uh, we, well, first of all, so we're actually, we use the Unity SDK uh, for Google Maps to build the location-based game, which was very exciting. Um, but in terms of safety alerts, so two considerations. So uh, the first is that we really want people to not be driving <laughs> when they're playing this game. Um, that's actually a common occurrence because sometimes people will want to drive to a specific location to collect, let's say, the red-tailed hawk, which is a rare, a rare raptor or predator bird. And actually, I think that's it yeah, right that's there. Awesome. Um, Right now. And the second safety alert that comes up is um, please don't go on private property and make sure that you're not in the middle of the road while playing. Um, sometimes these locations uh, that are chosen by the Google Maps toolkit, um, sometimes they can be on sidewalks. So we just want to always remind people when they get into camera, you know, stay, away of your, stay aware of your surroundings and don't, don't go into the street. And certainly don't go into someone's backyard if there happens to be a bird there. And we do have also a few of these intro screens that explain the game to users, and they can always be accessed off the question mark as well. Um, and they're just four panels that describe the game. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So I'll, ju I'll just repeat the question as well. So the question was, um, how do you place pin drops on the map for birds and food tokens? And how are you choosing the locations that are deemed safe for users to play? So um, one of the reasons that we were excited to build this experience on top of Google Maps was that, of course, Google has the world's maps data. They're very aware of you know, what street corner is safe and what street corner has construction on really a day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour basis. And so the way our system works is that uh, we get to call the Google Playable Locations API, um, which is a large list of coordinates that's vetted by Google of what are the safe locations everywhere in the world. And we can basically filter these locations by the user's current GPS coordinates. So the way the workflow goes is user opens the Crikey app, um, we check their current location, um, then we call the Google API and pull down a list of playable locations. Um, and then once we have that list, we can then populate birds uh, and food tokens. And um, just to answer the second part of your question, which is how are we actually allocating birds and food tokens, um, there's a little bit of secret sauce there. So we obviously don't want all the birds to be readily available. Some birds are more rare than others. Um, and just the same way some food tokens are rarer than others. So our back end team handles that um, and distributes them accordingly. Yes. Yes. So if two users are on the same city block, they would get um, exactly the same uh, playable locations. But not necessarily the same birds or food yes. tokens in the same places. Because if one user has already collected the bald eagle, um, they wouldn't get that bird again on that same city block, if that makes sense. Hi, guys. Uh, you seem to use a lot AR Foundation and Google Maps, so like you are power users. <laughs> what do you consider your own um, creaky uh, know-how or like your own shtick? What is special about creaky in that sense? Could you, sorry, could you just repeat the last part of that? I just want to make sure that like, I fully what, understand. What do you question? consider your speciality on top of being a power user of uh, Unity and Google Maps SDK? Like, what yeah, I think differentiate you guys from the other people experimenting us? with... Unity, our foundation, and Google Maps. Thank you. Do you want to answer the first part, and then I can add on? Sure, yeah. I think definitely what differentiates us, there's not a lot of location-based AR games in the market today. Uh, in the next two weeks, we're going to have the same number of location-based AR games as Niantic, which has Pokemon Go and Harry Potter. 
Um, so we're very excited about being able to play in that space, in that market. It, there's a lot of opportunity beyond what we're building in terms of advertising options and um, bridging that physical and digital divide uh, with locations on the map along with game elements in app. Uh, beyond that, in terms of the IP that we've chosen so far, we've gone with a very definitive direction of conservation, empathy building, and trying generally to uh, build games without violence and that are focused on positive actions or hopefully to inspire positive actions in the real world. Uh, and so far that has been uh, something that I think really differentiates us within this space and within gaming in general. And I'll let Kedeki speak probably a little more to the technology side. Yeah, so before I talk about um, on the tech side what differentiates Crikey, I just want to add briefly to, to John V's answer about the empathy point um, and so I guess sort of point to some research um, that kind of grounded our decision. So uh, there's this famous theory called the media equation, uh, which suggests that users respond to media events the same way they do the, to real life events. So for example, um, this is why people are afraid of horror movies, right? We know that, 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 that the clown and it is not real, but we still feel afraid of it because from an evolutionary standpoint, um, we have this fight or flight reaction. Um, so why is that relevant to Crikey and what we're talking about today? Well, when you apply the media equation theory to immersive media, we see these effects are heightened tenfold. So for example, when people experience things in virtual or augmented reality, they actually cannot differentiate them from real life events. And so therefore, when you're in an experience where you embody somebody of a different gender, a different race, or even a different species, you actually take on characteristics and empathy for that subgroup. Um, and there's hundreds of research articles that have been cited many times over that show that these effects from just five minutes of immersion one time can last up to two or three weeks. So when you take that time time factor and you look at a mobile app like this, which is consumer facing and people might be opening this every single day, um, the opportunities to generate empathy and real world action, um, positive action, for example, for conservation causes in the long term is enormous. And so really our goal at Crikey is to try to use this as a tool um, to, to have people look back at the natural world and take positive action. Um, and then on the technical side, in addition to what we've, what we've discussed today, um, Crikey also has a couple of customizations that we've built inside of Unity. So I know it was just announced at the keynote that Unity is now available as a library, um, which is super exciting. Um, Crikey actually built Unity as a library just internally for ourselves back in 2017. Um, and this allows us to run Unity just inside of the camera view on both iOS and Android. And then we have a message manager in Swift and Java um, that allows us to hand off camera control, uh, file paths to recorded videos by Unity, et cetera, between the mobile app side, um, which again is written in native code, and then um, the Unity portion of the app. Um, and then we also have a custom video slicer that we wrote ourselves, um, which allows us to slice together multiple videos in real time, um, and then hand them off to the user so they can edit them and then post them to Crikey or elsewhere. And then, oh, we also have some custom computer vision uh, plugins that we've written as well, um, one of which I described briefly, the occlusion one, um, but we have some others in, in the works too. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to repeat the question also for Ooh, other yes. folks in the room. Yeah. yeah, so sorry. So the question was, um, AR Foundation looks to be very stable. The answer is yes, it obviously is. It's, it's awesome. Um, but what happens in a situation where, where maybe something goes wrong with AR Foundation and what's kind of our fail safe? So I think the default ground plane um, trick is a really, really good one. So typically the number one thing that a lay user is looking for when they come into an AR app is, and they don't even realize that they're looking for this, but they just like expect objects to be on the ground, which is, we would expect that in real life. So of course they expect that uh, for AR games. Um, and so using the default ground plane has been very successful for us. And again, like I was saying in the, the slides, because this is a consumer app, you know, people open the Crikey app in all sorts of places with varied lighting and textures and surfaces. So there is some percentage of the time where, you know, someone's in like a dark room and like we just cannot find the ground plane. And so in those cases, just using the default ground plane has been great. Um, and because you still have camera translation in that instance, the user doesn't think anything is broken because they can still get up close to the object and it still looks like it's getting closer. Um, obviously, we can't do sort of the full suite of features, like for example, people occlusion in like a dark room probably not going to work very well, um, but that's okay. At least we can still give them camera translation and, and make it look like we have a ground plane. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's really, really for both, though obviously safety is like the primary concern. So the way we have it set up is that um, we control when the camera gets turned on in location-based games. So um, there's a maps interface, and so users can see their pin moving on the map, and then when they're within just five feet of the playable location, that's when we turn on the camera. Um, and then we have sort of a fun prompt where there's some binoculars, and you kind of like look through the binoculars to find the ground plane. So it doesn't feel like you're finding the ground at all. Um, and the reason for that is that we, we don't want people to be just kind of looking straight ahead and then missing what's happening around them. Um, and then similarly, if they choose to walk away from the playable location, again, we automatically just turn off the camera if they're outside of that five foot radius. Um, and there was kind of some like play testing around that where it was originally 10 feet, and then we thought that five would be better just to kind of keep things as safe as possible. And there is sort of an invisible parameter around the ecosystem and the bird so that people don't keep walking and expanding the trees into the street. So we, try, we tested different sizes and uh, tried to keep it pretty conservative so people would stay safe. Awesome. Well, we will be down here if anyone has other questions that they don't feel comfortable asking in front of the whole group. We'd love to meet you. And thank you so much for coming out to our talk. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. There, 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 there.